Okay, well, welcome everybody. Welcome to our August call. If I haven't met you now, my name is Mark Reynolds. I'm a member of the CCL staff and uh, one of my favorite parts of my job is getting a chance to host this call. So since last month's call, uh, Representative Rooney introduced the Stenning Warming uh, Augmenting Pay Act of 2019 HR 4058. Uh, Representative Lipinski introduced the Raise Wages Cut Carbon Act uh, HR 3966. Senator Coons introduced the Climate Action Rebate Act S2284. Uh, Representative Panetta introduced the Climate Action Rebate Act and Representative Larsa introduced the America Wins Act that's HR 4142 and the one before that was HR 4051. So that's five more carbon pricing bills just since last month's call. Organizations that work on this but I think all of you are very clear that this is happening because of the work that you're doing to make carbon pricing a reality in Congress. So congratulations to all of you. I wanna just read you also a couple of quotes from an article in E&E News. Four of those bills came out uh, one week. Representative Larson's bill came out at the end of last week. This is uh, from the E&E News. It says, Freedom Caucus Chairman Mark Meadows, Republican North Carolina, has met with the Citizens Climate Lobby, which advocates for a carbon fee and dividend plan and has avoided some of the stronger attacks on, climber, on the Green New Deal launched by members of his caucus. While he hasn't committed publicly to supporting carbon pricing, he says his constituents have given him a reason to think about it. Representative Meadows, quote, it really has been the reason I've engaged on it, Meadows said in a recent interview. I don't think any of them voted for me, but they've been, they've been very thorough in their proposals and their ideas and it's really had a profound impact on me. The same article goes on to quote Senator Coons, who says, as long as our president continues to insist that climate change is a Chinese hope, and as long as he is the most forceful voice in the Republican Party, that creates a headwind, Coons told reporters. But the ways in which organizations like Citizens Climate Lobby are engaging on this is beginning to make a difference. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a phrase that I've been hearing in the uh, social justice circles recently that I like a lot. And that is that they say we move at the speed of trust. Uh, I like that phrase and I know that we would certainly like to move faster than we're moving, but that's the speed in which we're capable of moving. And I think one indicator of the enormous amount of trust that you've created with Congress is so far this year, you have had 264 face-to-face -face meetings with the House or Senate. So in 264 cases, you've gotten past the gatekeeper, the aides are so appreciative of the way you're working, they were actually meeting face-to-face. -face. That's a remarkable outcome, and I think that's an indicator of the level of trust that you are generating. Okay, so our guest today, Sam Daly Harris, I think most people are pretty familiar with the story of results creating effective SAM, essentially through results, grassroots advocacy, and Marshall deciding after his years of work with results that he thought the best answer to climate change was to um, start a grassroots organization modeled after results, which Marshall, Sam founded. And for the first few years of CCL, Sam was on the phone with us every week uh, making sure that the architecture was set up in a way that it had its best chance of success. But in the early, early 90s, in 1993, I think it was the exact year, Marshall was down in Costa Rica. He had made over 100 presentations to rotary groups, raising money to, for microcredit. He had raised $720,000. And the local uh, NPR station, KPBS, uh, heard about that, and they invited him to be on a radio show. The hotel he was in in Costa Rica only had two phone lines and they said, you're not using one of them. So one of the people he was working with him picked him up in a pickup truck, drove her to her house and he was able to join the radio. On that call, there was another person he'd never heard of or met whose name was Sam Daly Harris. Sam said um, that he had also raised money uh, for microcredit, but it was $150 million and was from the federal government. Marshall, knowing how hard fundraising was, said, holy cow, this be better be someone that I connect with. I think providence is a good thing. You know, it's okay to get lucky. And we were certainly lucky in that moment uh, that Marshall heard Sam's voice on that call, made a connection, and I think that we owe a lifetime of gratitude to Sam for his help in getting this organization started, also results, and then you'll hear about some of the organizations he's working with. So Sam Daly Harris, uh, we're so thankful for everything you've done, and we're especially thankful that you could join us this today. Welcome. 
Great. It's a thrill to be with you. I'm going to see if I can share my, there it is, slides. And I'm going to just start with uh, this particular quote, um, which is, uh, well, oh, let's, yep, there you go. okay. Optimism is a political act. Those who benefit from the status quo are perfectly happy with a large population of people who think nothing's going to get any better. In fact, these days, cynicism is obedience. What's really radical is being willing to look right at the magnitude and difficulty of the problems we face and still insist that we can solve those problems. As grateful as Mark has been to me, I am more so grateful to CCL for the inspiration you bring to my life every day. So I'm really grateful. And I want to give a special thank you to Marshall Saunders, who called me in October 12 years ago at my son's Little League game just before he was going to do the first CCL presentation. He wanted a little encouragement and he was saying, I hope at least four people will sign up for the first CCL chapter. At the end of the Little League game, Marshall called back and said there were 29 in the room and all 29 signed up. My son was nine years old at the time. He's now 21 and he works for the Arizona Diamondbacks doing analytics and CCL has grown up also. And I couldn't be prouder. I wanna use this quote from futurist uh, Buckminster Fuller to point to what Marshall was doing and what you do also. The things to do are the things that need doing, that you see need to be done, and that no one else seems to see needs to be done. I'm gonna talk about advocacy, and advocacy is on a spectrum. And I'm gonna talk about one point on that spectrum. Deep, appreciative, bipartisan, relational advocacy. The resistance movement is different, but equally important point on that spectrum. The title of my talk, which I've done 25 times this year, is Are Shouting and Silence Our Only Two Options? Uh, I always say I'm thinking of changing to Are Shouting, Silence, and Online Petitions Our Only Three Options? Bringing Bipartisanship and Transformation to Citizen Activism. Now, this is a talk I do for newbies, and I know you're not newbies, but as I say, I want you to see what I say to the newbies. Three main messages. Number one, you can make a profound difference on big issues with your voice as a citizen. Number two, you probably haven't, I say to my newbies, because of your sense of powerlessness and resignation about politics, especially federal politics. And message number three, if you find an organization, big word, if you find an organization committed to dissolving the powerlessness, you can make a profound difference on these big issues. You found the organization, congratulations. I'm gonna do a shortened version of my story of self, my, my tra tra transit from hopelessness to action. I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in music. And I played percussion instruments in the Miami Philharmonic Orchestra for 12 years. And 12, uh, 39 years ago, I started the anti-poverty lobby results. And a lot of times I'm asked music poverty lobby, what was the motivation for that change? And when I look back in my life, there are several experiences that pointed to a new direction. I graduated from high school in 64. I graduated from college in 68. A friend, a, young, a year younger fraternity brother died right around high school graduation in 64. Robert Kennedy was assassinated right around college graduation in 68. And these deaths had an impact on me and began me asking the questions of purpose. Why am I here? What am I here to do? What's my purpose? Nine years after 68, I'm invited to a presentation on ending world hunger put on by the Hunger Project. And I go to this thing thinking, well, hunger's inevitable. What do I know? I'm a musician. I mean, it's inevitable because there are no solutions because if there were solutions, somebody would have done something now. by now. I know how ordinary folks uh, think. Uh, so I went to this thing and it was obvious right away, there was no mystery to growing food or clean water, or basic health or literacy. I, I, I wasn't hopeless as I thought 
about that. I was hopeless about human nature. People would just never get around to doing the things that could be done. But there was one human nature I had some control over, my own, and my questions, why am I here? What am I here to do? So I get involved in a big way. This is the end of the story. In 1978, 1979, I speak to 7,000 high school students, classroom by classroom by classroom. And before going into the first classroom, I read some statements from the US National Academy of Sciences calling for the political will to end hunger. So I asked 7,000 high school students, what's the name of your member of Congress? I don't wanna know if you wrote him. I don't wanna know if you met him, just the name. Out of 7,000 students asked, 200 could answer correctly, just under 3%. 6,800 didn't know, just over 97%. And results grew out of this gap between the calls for the political will to end hunger on the one hand and the lack of basic information on who represents us in Washington on the other. My first main message is you can make a profound difference on big issues with your voice as a citizen. Here come my examples. Results started lobbying on child survival in the early 1980s and UNICEF, UN Children's Fund, was reporting that 41,000 children around the world were dying every day from largely preventable, underlying preventable, malnutrition and disease, things like measles coupled with malnutrition. Results volunteers lobbied every year, 84, 80, every year, 97, 98, every year, just for a few months at the beginning of the year on child survival and a few other key issues. The latest report from UNICEF is that the 41,000 child deaths a day has fallen to 15,300. Still scandalously high, but clearly going in the right direction. In a New York Times interview that also focused on CCL, six years ago, Kul Gautam, a deputy executive director of UNICEF in years past said, quote, to a great extent, it was because of the receptivity created by results that US funding for child survival increased so dramatically, and that led other countries to come on board. So I wanna just take it briefly up to, to date a bit more in this, you can make a profound difference on big issues with your voice as a citizen. Maternal and child health, which has been one of the key drivers of this decline in child deaths, this year is funded at $835 million. President Trump asked for a 26% cut for next year. Now, 148 Republicans and Democrats in the House signed one letter, 37 in the Senate, another letter, urging a, a rejection of those cuts. So far, only the House has acted, and they've actually provided a 2% increase instead of a 26% cut, and the Senate action is pending. I'm gonna look a little more deeply at the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and malaria in this, you can make a profound difference on big issues. Uh, this year, the Global Fund is funded at $1.35 billion. The president asked for a 29% cut for next year. Actually, the House has acted uh, and provided a 16% increase. 157 Republicans and Democrats in the House signed one letter to the top appropriators now the subcommittee on this appropriations only has nine members. When you get a letter signed by 157 of your colleagues, you start to pay a bit of attention. And uh, so far the, set, the house has provided a 16% increase. I wanna go deeper for a moment, away from the 1.35 billion, 29% cut and all of that to the human side of this, the humanity of it. The Global Fund and its partners have saved 27 million lives in the last 17 years and provided antiretroviral therapy for 17.5 million uh, in 2017 alone. I'm gonna read uh, an excerpt from uh, Race Against Time by Stephen Lewis. He was Kofi Annan's special envoy for AIDS in Africa in the 2000s. He's talking about little girls who can't go to school because when their mother is ill 
because they have to care for her or grandparents who care for their grandchildren because their own children and their spouses had died. And now in this section that I'm gonna read, he's talking about sibling headed households where the grandparents and the parents themselves have all passed and it's siblings who are the head of the household. In this fourth story, Lewis tells how he and Gracious Michelle, the wife of the late Nelson Mandela, are taken to a sibling headed household in Uganda. Quote, there were five children in all, Lewis recounted, three girls, 14, 12, and 10, and two boys, 11 and eight. We entered the modest hut with our backs to the wall. Grasha with her arm around the three girls on her right, and I with my arm around the two boys on my left. Grasha then told all the hangers on to leave, all the media, all the UN staff, except for one community worker and one translator. I had no idea what was coming. Grasha turned to the two older girls and in a most gentle, reassuring voice asked, have you started to menstruate yet? The two little girls, clearly startled, replied in those barely audible whispered voices so characteristic of African children. Yes. Then Grasha began to ask a series of questions. Do you know what it means? Have you talked with anyone? Do you talk with the villagers about it? Your teachers, fellow students, does anyone bring you any pads? The atmosphere was intense. The little girl now fully embraced in Grasha's arms seemed to have suspended breathing. And I suddenly understood that I was witness to the first act of mothering that these girls had ever received about one of the most transfiguring experiences of a young girl's life. I've told this story a number of times because the experience had a profound impact on me. At the moment that Grasha asked her questions, I thought to myself, that's what's happening right across the continent. The transfer of love and knowledge and values and experience from one generation to the next is gone. And with it goes the confidence and security and sense of place, which children normally take for granted. Children already, already traumatized by the death of their parents are left reeling as they confront the void in the aftermath. As we were leaving, I asked the oldest sister, who puts you to bed at night? I put everyone to bed, she replied. But bedtimes can be pretty scary, I offered. The nights are dark, the dreams can be upsetting. Don't any of the neighbors come in to help? No, she said matter-of-factly. I put them to bed myself. I'm the mother, end of quote. So I did that really to go beyond the 1.35 billion, the 29% cut and get to the humanity of what the Global Fund to Fight AIDS to be TB and malaria can be. So if our voices as citizens can have such a profound impact, I tell my newbies, why don't more of us get involved? That leads to our sense of powerlessness. Uh, Francis Morlepay, who wrote Diet for a Small Planet decades ago, in a more recent book wrote, our real problem is not a heating planet or rampant malnutrition. We only have one real problem, our own feelings of powerlessness to manifest the solutions right in front of our noses. And that's what I, when I say the gifts of the group that Civic Courage coaches like CCL is their deep commitment to dissolving the powerlessness. So again, if our voices as citizens can make such a profound difference on big issues, why don't more of us get involved? That leads to our resignation. Harvard professor Lawrence Lessig said three years ago, we did a poll and found that 96% of Americans believe it important to reduce the influence of money in politics, but 91% said it isn't possible. That's the politics of resignation, but the politics of resignation gives you a perfect strategy for winning. How do we thaw that resignation? Because once we do, then I think we have a real chance of winning. And that's what CCL does, works really hard to thaw the resignation. So here's a common view of most groups doing advocacy work that are not really up for thawing the resignation. It's a very, it's just a head of organizing for a very big group like Care Save the Children, Oxfam World Vision. He said to me about five years ago, we can't let our volunteers write letters to the editor or op-eds because they'll get it wrong and misrepresent the organization. Yeah, 
groups really say that. They actually think that and act that way. Then I show that citizen climate lo lobby volunteers had 4,282 letters to the editor, op-eds and editorials published last year, up from 65 in 2010. One group is saying they'll get it wrong and misrepresent the organization. CCL saying, what do we got to do to help them get it right and give that to them so they can be uh, set free? How does it work? You know about that. I want to touch on the champion scale. I hope we'll get to it if there's Q&A, where we move anyone who's opposed up to being neutral, a congressperson who's neutral up to being a supporter. We don't stop there. We move supporters up to being advocates, Congress people who are advocates up to being leaders and eventually to being champions. This is where I show my sign up sheet. I don't pass it out yet. I want them to be more awake before I do, but I invite them to check one box or zero, no more than one. And they're basically saying, I'd like to learn more about starting or joining a chapter of results on any poverty, CCL on climate solutions, et cetera. A politics of love. I'm going to pretty much close with this section, a spiritual approach to politics. Uh, in E&E &E News almost two years ago, Tom Moyer, a citizen climate lobby volunteer who worked with former Representative Mia Love, Republican of Utah, said, it's impossible to convince anyone of anything if you fundamentally don't like them. If you walk in thinking they're an idiot and evil, you're done from the start. It doesn't matter how logical your position is. You have to put yourself in a place where you can find something to respect in them. And I'm gonna read this little segment from Reclaiming Our Democracy. Uh, Ellie Sparks, a volunteer at the time, joined CCL, this is maybe, I don't know, seven years ago, and said she was suffering from climate trauma when she joined. She would read Bill McKibben's book, Earth, and she would weep at home, she would weep at work, then she joined CCL, and 18 months later, she's co-leading a workshop at the conference seven years ago, 2012, and she says this on the national conference call a month later. Our director, Mark Reynolds, likes to say, we're betting the farm on relationships. Then he tells us we need to build relationships with members of Congress and editorial writers. Most of us CCL volunteers had never done that before, what in the world does a relationship with a member of Congress look like? How do we connect with an editorial page editor? Some of us have found models for those relationships in other parts of our lives. Gary in Boston likes to use the model of a work relationship. My relationship model is different. I adore romantic relationships, so I use romance as my model. That first meeting with the editorial writer, it's like a blind date. Only you've decided beforehand you're going to marry this fellow. You're going to be sweet and interesting, not too intense. If it doesn't work out with the editor, you're going to marry one of his friends at the newspaper, the environment writer, business editor, city editor. Someone at this newspaper will find you interesting and compelling. It's just a matter of being persistent until you find the right connection. Then she says, I see the relationship with a member of Congress as an arranged marriage. She was working with her team uh, with Eric Cantor, the House Majority Leader at the time. Uh, if you live in the district, the member's aide has to meet with you. That's what our ledge director said in January. Since then, we've had five meetings with the ledge director in 2012. We schedule 45 minute meetings with him. He keeps us well over an hour. He doesn't want us to leave. Why? Because a good arranged marriage starts out cold and heats up over time. That's different than a love match, which starts out hot and slowly cools down. I'm gonna skip a few paragraphs and close with this genius. During our conference, I met with 20 congressional offices. I met with many folks whose view of the world was very different than mine. Going into their offices was hard. I had to let go of a lot of emotional baggage. I could no longer judge them or hold hostility in my heart toward them. I had to let go of my fear of climate change and my fear that they wouldn't listen to me. I had to center myself in love. S releasing fear and centering in love, this is sacred and profound work. So the main message is I tell my newbies, you can make a profound difference on big issues with your voice as a citizen. You probably haven't because of your sense of powerlessness and resignation. 
about politics, especially federal politics, if you find an organization committed to dissolving the powerlessness, you can make a profound difference. Then I pass out my sign-up sheet. I want to learn more about joining us, starting a chapter of one of these groups that's committed to dissolving the uh, powerlessness. Don't sign four, three, just one, or zero. Zero is fine. You're looking for a group that's going to help you move out of your comfort zone and over to where the magic happens. And Mark, I think I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I've got two more slides, but let's see if I've gone over and what we can uh, do with any time remaining. Okay, good. Let me, let me just check. Ricky, do you have a question in the chat that you want to um, uh, ask Sam? Yeah, mostly in the chat is just comments. Um, so if you've got questions, go ahead, Mark. And if you do have uh, uh, questions for Sam, please type them in the chat and we'll, I'll get them in just a moment. Okay, Sam, while we wait for questions, was there another point you wanted to make? Um, well, I was gonna close with this quote from George Bernard <laughs> Shaw's Man and Superman. This is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose, recognized by yourself as a mighty one, the being a force of nature, instead of a selfish, feverish, little clot of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I am of the, the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community, and it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die, for the harder I work, the more I live. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle to me. It is a sort of splendid torch, which I've got hold of for the moment, and I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. Uh, and Ricky can make these slides available if anyone's interested in the quotes or other things that I used. Absolutely. Great. And we Sam, you have, oh, go ahead. Let's take one question and then we'll, we'll move on to actions. Thanks, Ricky. Yeah, yeah we have one question. Um, uh, someone wants to know, Sam, uh, you know, how do you get to that point where you can uh, get into love with the person that you're speaking with, even if you disagree with them? You know, what, what are some thoughts about how, how does yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's, I don't, I'm certainly not in a, okay, you just did a seriously negative thing. I love you. You just really screwed up on whatever issue in Congress. I love, I think it's a process where you see where it is that someone is and that you kind of do a calming with yourself. I have this quote that I took out. It was something from, uh, you might think that your member of Congress, you, you may have a low opinion uh, of your member of Congress, but you have to decide whether you want to be right about that or cause a transformation. It's really up to you. We'll never get climate solution, poverty ended with Democrats only or Republicans only. It has to be cross-partisan. And so uh, it's really a decision and a centering of oneself to go for the gold, the transformation, rather than going for being right. If I could just add, if anyone wants to join the Civic Courage mailing list or suggest a lecture opportunity or learn more about hosting a book group on reclaiming our democracy with the author and me calling into the group, just write me at sam at civiccourage.org. Sam, fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, again, we owe a lifetime of gratitude to you and, uh, and thank you for being uh, with us today. Thank you so much. All right, great. Okay, what we're gonna do is go over the Canadian and US actions and then um, show you a new tool we have to give you more feedback actually during the call. And then a couple of uh, reports from last, uh, since additional things other than five bills. Five bills isn't so bad, but more stuff happened than that. So Canada, if you remember from last month, said we were gonna do our same actions for two months. So that's continue to use the election laser talks to get letters to the editor. And then also we hope that you're attending the events in your writing, for, you know, barbecues except with the candidates so that you're actually out there meeting the candidates. Part of the US action is a continuation, which is we asked you to do some uh, grass tops outreach and we're now gonna focus that effort. Uh, so you'll see there's additional resources on the action sheet to focus the grass to Tops our outreach. And then also in terms of grassroots outreach, we're asking you to um, connect with a local chapter of another organization. And certainly we hope as part of that, uh, that you um, are super interested in what they're trying to do and how we can help them. 
Um, last month, we added something where there was an online question where you could respond to one of the things we were doing, which is asking you what kind of outreach you do on um, to youth. And we got fantastic responses of the kinds of things people are doing for outreach. The question that's on the form this uh, month is, who is on your list of persuasive community leaders? Why did you prioritize them and how do you plan to engage with them? So that you can actually answer that question on the form. Ricky's also putting the link in here. We love hearing from you. We think that it allows us to additionally focus the call and everything we're doing. If we hear from you, these kinds of questions. So again, this month's question is, who is on your list of persuasive community leaders? What did you do to prioritize them? And how do you plan to engage with them? Okay, then additionally, uh, we have a tool that you can actually sign on and respond to now, which Rick, Ricky's gonna show you in just a moment. Oh, Ricky doesn't like me to talk about him, but I'm going to anyway. So many of you possibly know that Ricky's the head of IT and he co-hosts this call with me every month. But when Ricky was a volunteer, Ricky actually built CCL University and CCL Community. So he came in as a volunteer. He said, boy, this organization could really use some infrastructure. And so he built it. And so now he's going to go over this piece with us where you can tell us what you're excited about working on at this point. Ricky, I'll hand it off to you for just a moment. All right, thanks, Mark. So as you know, Mark just mentioned in our actions this month focus on two of the five levers of political will that we have, and those are grassroots outreach and grass tops outreach. But you know, we're often wondering, you know, what levers are we, you most excited about back in the district? And so we're gonna give you that opportunity to tell us which levers you're excited about working on for the remainder of the summer. And so we're gonna try out something a little bit new for the monthly call. We've tried this maybe on some group leaders calls. And if you were at the conference this past summer, you saw uh, Dr. Aho uh, use this new polling option. Um, and we're gonna ask right now if you would uh, tell us, using your smartphone, and I'll walk you through how to do that in just a moment, which of these levers of political will are you most excited about working on for the remainder of the summer? So you can see the five levers of political will, they're on the screen. And if you are uh, on the phone, I'll just read these for you. Uh, the first one is, number one is for lobbying Congress. Number two is for media relations. Number three is for grassroots outreach. Number four is for grass tops engagement. Number five for chapter development and organizing. And number six, I love them all, I can't decide. Okay, <laughs> so how do you participate? You can see at the top of the screen, it says text, so whip out your smartphone, pull up your uh, text messaging app, and text the number, uh, text six CCL, one, two, three, to the number two, two, three, three, three. So text CCL one, two, three, to the number two, two, three, three, three. And then once you join, once you do that, you're gonna get the uh, confirmation message that comes back to you. And then all you have to do is reply to the confirmation message with the numbers one through six, whichever one you see on the screen that you're most interested in continuing to work on through the remainder of the summer. So Mark, I'll turn it back over to you and you can give us some color commentary. Yeah, Ricky, can you read the numbers? Because I can only see the partial percentage because of the faces I can see on the screen also. Oh, yeah. So right now it looks like, uh, well, <laughs> it changes every couple of seconds. But it looks like lobbying Congress is in the lead, about 23, 24% with grassroots outreach uh, and chapter development organizing really coming in. Uh, in second place, sort of tying there at anywhere from 20 to 18 percent. Yeah. Okay, good. And then I can see ranging between 10 and 12 percent. Uh, uh, I can't, I love them all. I can't decide. So um, it's, it's great because we need to, we do need an across the board use of all the different levers. So there's a lot of people who are still interested in lobbying Congress the rest of the year, media relations, uh, grassroots is so important, grass tops is so important, chapter development. Uh, so thank you for this. We are going to add more of this so that we can get uh, more feedback from you during the calls. I think it allows us to better focus the organization because this is a volunteer organization and it really gives us a chance to get the kind of feedback of what's meaningful, what's important, what's of value to you and send that back to you. So that's fantastic, Rick. Ricky, you can go ahead and, uh, and un unshare that for just a second. Thank you for doing that, Ricky. Um, Cool, okay, so a couple of things. Uh, one thing, this week also a new media packet came out. So this is a great time of year to set up editorial board meetings going into the fall, coming out of the August recess. So your group leader and your media, your head of media should have gotten a new media packet to take to papers um, and uh, um, 
set up hopefully editorial board meetings in the fall. Also our speaker next month is Jonathan Haidt. The last time he was on the call was in 2013. At that point he was talking about moral foundation theory. If you don't know of him or his work, talk to the other people in your chapter who are because there's a lot of people have been asking to have him back for quite a while and we are excited about that. So I mentioned that um, so far, uh, year to date, we've had 264 meetings that were face to face with members of the House and Senate and that is remarkable. Um, we've also had over 3,000 outreach events. We'd actually had a goal early this year to have 2,000 outreach events by the end of April and you did it, which is remarkable, which meant we had over um, 900 in April alone. But this year, excuse me, 2,910 outreach events in addition to the hundreds of letters to the editor and op-eds that you've published so far this year, you have submitted 5,000, I mean, excuse me, 59,761 um, personal letters to members of Congress. So thank you for that. That is also remarkable. Uh, we now have 38 municipalities that have endorsed not just uh, carbon fee and dividend or pricing carbon, but the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And that includes this month, Salt Lake City, Utah, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Ashland, Wisconsin, Nevada City, California, and Navajo Nation from Tuba City in Arizona, and also Navajo Nation from Cameron Chapter in Arizona. So I don't know, when I got that report that two Navajo tribes had supported the bill, that was just really, really something and, and uh, hit me in a really, really positive way. Okay, last thing I want to say is this is um, last weekend I thought was a really, really bad weekend for our country. And um, it was made more immediate for me because somebody that I work with every single day, Susan Flores Higgins, who works at headquarters with me, is from El Paso. And um, in addition to reading the news, seeing somebody who was trying to track down their family, their friends, uh, people they knew, um, it just hit a little bit closer to home than usual uh, and made it obvious to me how um, all those people were real people with real families. And um, I give everything I have to this organization every day. Um, I don't work on other issues. And so I was thinking about the other big issues that we face as a country. And um, uh, I, don't, I don't think this is a cop out and I no, hope it's not a cop out, but I think yours and my work to get democracy to work is the best way that our country can address the big problems it has. So um, uh, I think you and I can have a clean conscience that we're doing the things that we should be doing. And uh, I know that we are 100% focused on um, getting an effective, clean, transparent price on carbon. But I also think our work to make democracy work uh, is really important and gives us the best chance we possibly have to solve big problems. So thank you all for that. Last thing, uh, Ricky's going to unmute everybody's line. And um, if you want to just give a shout out to Sam for being on the call and all the work that he did to help us get here, uh, that would certainly make me uh, happy. So thank you all for being on the call. We'll see you in September with uh, Professor Hyde. Hi, everybody. Hi. Everybody's <laughs> 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 <laughs>